Hi guys, Rony here and welcome to the workshop. Today we have an indoor trainer test on the cards. Since it is the middle of winter, I think it's quite fitting. Just like the power meter, Marjin have sent me this T300 smart trainer to test. So today I'm going to tell you all about it. So as you can see probably from the pictures, it's a direct drive unit, similar to the Wahoo Kicker, for example, that I've been using. It has a relatively budget-oriented price of $749. So compared to the higher-end brands, I think it's a pretty good deal, assuming that it works as advertised. The specs themselves are very decent. So you have gradient simulation up to 22%. You have a maximum resistance of 2,600 watts, which is massive and more than enough. It does have Ant Plus, FTMS, and Bluetooth, as you would expect. So all the protocols you need for your training apps. And um, that makes it quite a compelling choice. It doesn't have uh, the latest features of the most high-end units, such as Wi-Fi connectivity, direct connectivity, or race mode, or 10 hertz uh, refresh rate. It has an optical-based uh, power meter sensor, promising a an accuracy of plus or minus 2%. So now I need to find out whether the claims are correct. But first, let's check what is in the box. So the packaging, pretty sturdy. You got a cardboard box with some foam insert, just like on many other units. It's quite a heavy one as well, over 20 kilos. With every purchase, you are eligible for this sweepstakes where you can win additional machine products. On top of the box, we have the accessories. So this is the power supply unit. Pretty standard stuff. Uh, we have the European version of the cord here, of course. Then here you have the fittings for your bike. So you get quite a robust quick release here with a nice long lever arm. You also get an N plus stick, which is a neat addition. Not many uh, companies actually supply this, but if you're running this from a laptop or desktop computer, uh, then this will come in very handy. And then of course you have uh, the spacers and reducers that you use uh, to fit your bikes. Obviously, we have through axle and quick release compatibility. For disc brake bikes, you also get a pad spreader, which is nice. I have never seen that included before. You also get a clip that clips into a brake caliper. So in case you accidentally pull on the brake, uh, you don't mess up your brake alignment. So really everything you need to get started. Now let's have a look at the trainer itself. A riser block for the front wheel is also included, which also is quite rare with other brands. You get the manual here and the quick start guide, which contains, well, it's not really a complicated setup, but you can use that in case you're stuck. And some more information there. So let's pull out the unit. It's quite a compact one, very slim design. So as you can see with the feet folded, doesn't take up too much space at all. So if you lay it flat, you can put it under a bed or somewhere where it's convenient to store. As you can see, it also comes equipped with a cassette. Now, again, just like I said, with the chain rings from aftermarket companies, it usually is the case with cassettes as well that the shifting is usually not so great. So I would have been really curious to see this, but unfortunately it's an 11-speed cassette and I don't have any 11-speed bikes. 
on my hands anymore. So I'll just swap that for a Shimano one to be able to use this power meter. The built-in handle is also very sturdy and stable, so it's easy to move around. I really like that feature. Again, not all uh, companies do that, so that's a nice touch. The feet can be folded out by pressing these orange tabs here, just like that. And they're also adjustable uh, to bring your bike up to level. It is here actually quite good on this, this surface. Nowadays, it's quite fashionable to build in some kind of movement or lateral or fore and aft movement into the body of the trainer itself. So all of high-end brands uh, do that these days. This doesn't have that, but considering the price point, um, obviously you can't expect all of the latest and greatest features. But other than that, the unit looks sturdy. And... Uh, yeah, also the clearances here are quite nice. So I imagine that the compatibility will not be limited by too many bikes. It's also very slim in this direction. So yeah, now it just remains to put my bike on it and reference first the power numbers compared to my trusty power to max MG and Wahoo pedals. So we have three points of reference there that we can compare, see if anything is trending a bit differently. Uh, what I'm also going to test is the erg mode, how quickly it reacts, and uh, free ride mode, how quickly and how intuitively does it change the gradient. Of course, ride feel is also important. That's a bit subjective, but still, uh, I will keep an eye on that. And uh, last but not least, how is the connectivity? Does it drop the signal? Um, does it stay on, connected, etc. So this is a T T300 plus trainer. Now let's have a look at what it can do. Okay, guys. So now the test of the Magin T300 smart trainer is over. I've put a good few hours on it to test various scenarios and uh, use cases. So now I'm ready to report some of my results. So the first thing I wanted to find out, how is the trainer regarding uh, general riding on Zwift? That's where I ride, but it would be the same for other apps uh, as it's compatible with all of them. So the free ride mode, I think is quite a good test of the trainer. It gives you an idea of how is it to pedal? How can it vary the resistance? and how is the right feeling overall. So let's start with the overall features of the trainer. So as I showed you earlier, the foldable base is really handy and adjustable. So I managed to set it up so the bike is nice and level. It also doesn't give any rocking motion. And what I said earlier is that it doesn't have any mechanism uh, for movement built in. However, there is still quite a lot of movement as the base is not completely stiff. However, one odd thing that I found is that it's quite a lot less stiff to the right side. And I think this is mainly because if you look at it, the bike kind of sits outboard to the drive side, which gives you a bit of a weird pedaling feeling when um, you're riding out of the saddle. So the bike feels as if it was tipping to the right side. So that's a bit of a negative and I think it could be fixed with a bit of a different design. Also, I needed to use the riser block, uh, otherwise the bike was not level. So keep an eye on that. On most modern trainers, you don't need to use a riser block anymore. They're designed to be level uh, without any other equipment. So this one does need it, otherwise you're riding downhill basically, and that's not a very pleasant feeling. If you talk about the general simulation, uh, it's very quick, very responsive. I've used it on 100% gradient simulation on Zwift. So we got steep uphill, steep downhills. It's all simulated very well. However, if you go to a very undulating section of road on Zwift, uh, for example, the jungle section, 
or the one just before uh, the main sprint where the gradient changes quite a lot, quite dramatically and over repeated periods. There you can notice some kind of delay. Usually it's around three, four seconds of lag when you're still uh, going uphill. Uh, it's fine, but as soon as you crest the climb, you still get that uh, large distance on there, despite the fact that you're already uh, coasting downhill. So that's a bit weird and noticeable. However, I'm coming from the top of the line kicker bike. So you can say that I'm a bit spoiled. Most trainers do that at this price point. So I think that's completely acceptable. And uh, yeah, you, the unit does very well overall. As for the power numbers in free ride mode, I've noticed uh, that the power is quite jagged compared to the other two reference power meters I had on there. So the first one, as I said, is the Wahoo Powerlink pedal. The other one was the Power to Max NG, as you'll be able to see in the files, as these are two reputable units that tracked very well close together. Uh, so yeah, those were quite a lot smoother. However, that might just be a software or a display thing. So even though I had the three second average on, on Zwift, the power seemed to be unsmooth uh, completely. If you talk about the numbers themselves, they were surprisingly good, I have to say. So they were tracking basically one-to-one -one with the PowerLink pedals, mostly within 1%, usually around even half a percent of difference or less. And for some strange reason, the power to max crank, it read low compared to the other two. So that's why you need three power meters in comparison, ideally, because then you can point out which one is wrong. I think for some reason that unit measures downwards uh, in indoor scenarios, because then I retested the same thing with the pedals and the power meter spider and outdoors it was completely matched. Evenly, it was basically one to one. So the power accuracy is good with one exception. If you go to sprints or short efforts, uh, of up to 700 watts, then the power starts to drift. You will also be able to see this from the files. This is also a common occurrence with different trainers. And um, yeah, this unit reads quite high. I did a sprint of around 950. Both parameters reported that very similarly, whereas the trainer gave me a number of upwards of a thousand watts. So that's quite a bit of a discrepancy there. But it happens and it's a really an extreme use case. And it's handy for Zwift races if you're using the Zwift uh, or this trainer for Zwift. Then the second thing that's very important for a smart trainer is how well it does handle erg mode. So for this, I did a workout with some steady efforts with some over-unders just to see how well it changes the set point. And uh, Honestly, it performed even better there compared to free ride mode because the set point was set in usually within two seconds. So it's very typical of other smart trainers as well. First, you get a big surge of resistance the power spikes up, then it swings down a little bit and then it sets. And that was the case for all the intervals that I've done. 10 seconds, 30 seconds, 10 minutes. It did it every time and it was very smooth and predictable. And it also nicely tracked. If I overshot the power, it fairly quickly managed to wind down the resistance. So I just keep spinning up and vice versa. So for me, it was really, really good uh, in that regard. Also the power numbers uh, tracking even better for the next few tests because, well, the unit was not brand new anymore. It had a bit of a break in. I also did some spin downs for calibration on all of the units to make sure they're on the same page and it did work. So yeah, uh, I'm very satisfied with the power numbers that we took out of it. Some of them are public on my digital profile so you can do some analysis yourself, but I'm very happy with how it turned out. Now the question is that, is this a worthy competitor compared to other trainers of similar prices on the market? 
Now this being a relatively new brand and a new, relatively new unit, I can't really speak of uh, customer support or long-term durability and how the warranties are handled, etc. But as far as the performance goes, the features go, and uh, the power measurement goes, it's all perfectly on par with other offerings. So it's definitely an interesting alternative. So, so far, I can recommend this unit. Now we will be heading on to the other stage of this test. I'm going to test their spider-based power meter compared to some other trainer and the Wahoo Powerlink pedals and mostly for outdoor riding because that's what it's supposed to do. So if you're interested in that, stay tuned. That's all for today about this trainer. Thanks for watching and see you next time.